Hallelujah. Well, up on the screen, you will see that we are continuing a series here this morning on the seven messages, the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. It's part two, so the title of the message this morning is going to be the message to the church at Ephesus. I spent yesterday reading, absorbing, praying, and it was good that I was able to be given the time just to listen to what the Lord was speaking about these messages that are going to be brought out. It's one that I am excited to be able to simply share what's on my heart from God's Word. Because Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, starts off with these words. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Verse 3, blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Amen? That's some powerful stuff to just stop right there. In fact, I was tempted so many times yesterday to not even get into that first letter to the church at Ephesus, but the Lord had me keep going. We are going to read through, but the seven churches in Revelation are literal churches from the first century A.D. that were located in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. These seven churches have spiritual significance for churches and believers today. Why? Because it reveals the types of churches and individual believers that would surface time and time again throughout history. These letters truly deliver what I would call a report card for the churches of that time. But more relevant now than ever. They act as a quick and a very poignant reminder to anyone who call themselves followers of Christ. For various reasons, trade, military, or because of pure hedonism, these cities were major cultural hubs throughout history. During the first few centuries after Jesus Christ, these Roman-controlled cities were also important in early Christianity. If we go to the next two screens, we see a little bit of an idea of how these churches were fairly close in proximity 
where you see in the lower left-hand corner there, Ephesus being close to the water, to the Aegean Sea. So if you go to the next screen there, you'll see kind of an overview of more of a current map and where those churches are actually located. You don't see it on this map here, but very close to about 35 miles off the shoreline of Ephesus was the island of Patmos, which is where John was exiled. We're going to talk about that island today. We're going to talk about some of the things that were going on at that time. But you can again see where these are located. Again, you see Greece off to the left where you will find that Paul uh, arrives from the, that location in, over in Athens going towards these new church areas that were planted. It was Aquila and Priscilla with Paul that actually began that church in Ephesus. And it's important for us to understand how that was within the Roman Empire at that time, how it was important to the church and why it's important for us here today. Let's go to that next screen. Last week we began this series by looking into the book of Jude and understanding the concerns that were presented in many different scriptures, both by Paul and by Peter and throughout all of the word that began in Jude, verse 3, that we as Christians should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints here. These letters to the seven churches are a culmination or a, a recap, if you will, of many of these warnings. We continue this warning in this series of messages to the seven churches by first going back to chapter 1 of Revelation that we already began with. But I want to set the table for the purpose of John receiving this vision from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We will see that much of his purpose was to strengthen or to fortify these established churches that were under varying levels of persecution by the Roman Empire. If you remember back on that map there, we showed the seven different churches. There would be other churches within or under each of those different areas. So those seven churches would be more like a district, like there was a hub here. Ephesus was one main hub, and Laodicea was another hub of which the church of Colossae would have been a part of. All of these are different hubs that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to John and gave those warnings, gave those messages to it's very important for us today to understand what Jesus means by conquering and overcoming in a world that wars against the very soul of every Christian today across every continent. If you don't think that persecution is really a relative topic right now, all we have to do is turn on the nightly news to see how things are very subtly being placed in position for things to start falling, literally, into place. The, both the, the whole things that we see in uh, the past riots the current riots that are even down in the country of Cuba, they're all easily and someday very soon translate, could translate into some violent opposition 
to gospel preaching churches right here. We've already seen parts of that happening in different states. We've seen it in other countries. We see it even where persecution is being rampant in the country of Afghanistan right now. So the historical setting of Revelation chapter 1 is truly amazing. As we read where we left off at the beginning, verse 3, John said, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. You know, when it says that the time is at hand, I remember many, many years ago when I first became a Christian, I was super excited. I was telling my mom about it, and she was a Christian, but she said to me, she said, now just kind of, you know, calm down, Mark, because they've talked about the end times even when I was growing up during World War II. They said, the end is near. The end is coming. Do you see what's happening? And I remember that, thinking, okay, well, that's probably true. So what does it mean when the Word says the time is at hand? Second Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, Peter says this, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Peter goes on to explain, you're, you're not being very wise when you say those kind of things. Because look at what happened even with the flood. You see that things are completely changed, that things have happened. But he goes on in verse 8 of 2 Peter chapter 3, and he says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. It even says in Revelation 1 verse 9, goes on, to say, I, John, who also am your brother. I'm going to stop there just a minute. That name or that word brother comes from a Greek word, Adelphos, which I found interesting because John was given this revelation, told to write these things down, and as he did, he gave the credibility in this scripture that says, I, John, who also am your brother, Adelphus, which means it was a word used by the medical world to describe two people who were born from the same womb. I like that. My brother. My brother, I, John, your brother, we came from that same womb is what he was saying. It was given that same credibility that here is what I am declaring to you. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, John was not unaware of great tribulation and persecution. And we'll find out more here as we talk. Companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God, 
and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John begins and he says, I know the persecution, I know the tribulation that you have. I have endured it in that same patience in the kingdom with you. We have to understand here that John, who at the time of this writing in about 95, 96 A.D., had been sent into exile as a political prisoner to the Isle of Patmos. John, at that time, was the only living and leading apostle who resided just outside of the city of Ephesus. There's actually, if you go back to that area, his home is still marked. They still have it as an archaeological site where John lived on a hill outside of Ephesus from his home situated on a hill. He would have been able to hear the roar of the stadium in Ephesus as they held their gladiator fights, as they had their chariot races, as they had the savage spectator sports of Christians and other prisoners being fed to wild beasts. That was happening in that area, in that stadium, right where John was living. The temple of Artemis could be seen from his home. The other apostles had already been martyred, gone on before. Peter, it's reported, was crucified upside down around the year 65 A.D. Paul was beheaded in Rome in the year 67 A.D., all about 30 years prior to the time that John was found as a political prisoner on the island of Patmos. And the church at that time was undergoing severe persecutions from the Roman Empire. The Roman Emperor Domitian was recorded as one of the most barbaric and cruel rulers that ever reigned. In fact, the entire memory of Emperor Domitian was recorded that they obliterated all that he had done because he was so, so cruel. This Roman rule, ruler, Domitian, not only declared himself to be the final authority in controlling the empire, but considered himself, get this, to have descended from the very mythological uh, line of Jupiter. He considered himself to be an actual god. And that's what he declared others within that city, within that Roman Empire, to do, worship him, because he was the god. It was Domitian that ordered the arrest and a trial to be held in Rome against John for preaching the gospel of Christ and for alleged insurrections against the government. Insurrections because John would not offer the pagan worship incense in those temples. It was in Ephesus that the worship temple of Artemis drew many Romans to visit. And it is a location even today that is the most visited archaeological site in the world. It was a big time city. So we learn and understand from written history that the trial of John resulted in a sentence given down from this Roman emperor, Domitian, 
to throw him into a vat of boiling oil. Recorded, written history, details that John, as they observed him being thrown into that vat, they observed him crawling out, unharmed by the boiling oil. It was at that point that Domitian proclaimed that John was to be exiled to the island of Patmos. He couldn't do anything else with him, put him away on that island. That island would be similar to what we know or remember as the prison of Alcatraz. When prisoners were dropped off at this island, they were left there without any provision of food, without any provision of shelter. There was no clothing. You were on your own. It was like a scene from Survivor, except to the most extreme thing that you could imagine. There was no way to escape. There was very little vegetation or food to find. Most prisoners that were dropped off by these ships died quickly from starvation or from the extreme conditions of the weather alone. At the age of 95, John not only survived for nearly two years, he was on that island for 18 months, but he also received this revelation of Jesus Christ. Amazing what was going on at this time here. In Revelation 1, if we open up our Bibles to verse 12, I want to read through verse 20. This is where John turns to see the voice that spoke with him. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. At some point, sometime, we'll go back through those verses and we'll detail more of each and every facet of how the Lord appeared to John in this vision. Because each one is significant. Significant in all of the things in the garment that he wore and the feet that they were as bronze, which represents authority, and the, the golden girdle, which represented power, and all of those things that pertain, but significant was that it was Jesus Christ himself standing 
in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which are the churches that is explained here in that last verse 20. So understand this, that John certainly would have been, as it were, a dead man. To see this one that just how many years before he had laid his head upon his breast and he turned, it says, to see the voice. Interesting. How do you see a voice? You do it through the intimacy of a life that you recognize that voice. Didn't Jesus say, my sheep hear, they know my voice? That was John. He knew that voice. He turned to see the glory of the Master that was clothed as a high priest with all the power and authority standing for his church, for his churches, right in the middle of those seven golden candlesticks. A lot more to come on that, but for right now, let's continue here to the next screen, and let's talk about this church at Ephesus. As we move into Revelation chapter 2, the first church Jesus addresses in this grouping of seven churches in Asia Minor is Ephesus. Ephesus was the most important city in this part of the world for a number of reasons, as I've already mentioned. It was a very busy port city. Just about anything going into Rome or out of Rome from the east came through Ephesus. So you can imagine, as with most port cities, it was also a busy hub of commerce. Many people made their living in Ephesus. And much of the money that was made in Ephesus was related to the fact that it was the headquarters of false pagan religion in this part of the world. They were like the top dog of paganism. Anything going on that was uh, not only sexually uh, implicit and, and lousy was going on in that temple of Artemis. Ephesus was a center for demonic and occult activity in Asia Minor. Ephesus was also the center for the worship of the Roman empires. If they were to go to worship, they would come to that city of Ephesus. But even more important to Ephesus than their emperor worship was the fact that this city was the absolute hub of the worship of Artemis, a very important Greek goddess who was said to be the twin sister of Apollos and a daughter of Zeus. It is here where you would have seen the idol of Diana, the fertility goddess shown as the multi-breasted statue. Idolatry was one of the major economic engines in Ephesus. It was a literal Sodom and Gomorrah situation. The temple of Artemis in Ephesus was so awe-inspiring that it was named one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And we know from Paul's first visit to Ephesus in Acts 18 and 19 that the practice of dark magic was also very common in Ephesus. The point is, idol worship and the demons that were behind those idols were a driving spiritual force in Ephesus where that Christian church was also located. This idol worship industry employed many thousands of people with this idol, with all of this idol-driven demonic activity in Ephesus, it's no surprise that Paul gives his most detailed treatment 
on spiritual warfare to the Ephesian believers in chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians. This was a dark place spiritually, and as we'll see, the lampstand that was the church in Ephesus was not shining very brightly in all that darkness. So I'm going to divide this letter of Ephesus into three different sections. Section one is going to be the problem with the Ephesian church. Section two, we'll talk about the solution to the problem in the Ephesian church. And then lastly, we'll read of Jesus' warning and promise to the church in Ephesus. Go to that next screen, please. First, the problem with the Ephesian church is the loss of their first love. It's written, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. That verse 2 points out all of the different attributes, the good things that the church was doing. I know thy works. Jesus Christ is saying, I see all things. I know what's going on in your church. I see what you are in the middle of. But verse 3, he goes on and says, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. It's agreed that when Jesus talks about the church losing their first love, he's referring to both their loss of love for God and their loss of love for one another. Both the vertical and the horizontal expressions of love had been lost in that church at Ephesus. For most of the seven churches, Jesus first praises the church for the things that he considers good, as we just read. And that is true of this church in Ephesus as well, but with this church there's a difference in why Jesus lists these strengths. The reason he listed those good things first is because this problem of lovelessness or loss of love is so serious that it renders worthless their otherwise very impressive outward strengths. We know this because the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profit me nothing. It was made to understand that it didn't matter what apparent outward virtues you have. If you are absent with love, you have no real strengths, and in fact, you gain nothing and are nothing without charity. Amen? Love is the absolute heart of Christian morality and ethics. If you don't have that, plain and simple, you don't 
have anything. So it's interesting to note that this rebuke to Ephesus has even compared to the other churches. Ephesus is the only one that Jesus threatens with removing their lampstand. Jesus doesn't even make that threat to the church at Laodicea that we'll read uh, later in another message that he calls wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He doesn't threaten that church with removal, which is a uniquely serious problem that is present in Ephesus. So that raises the question. If lovelessness cancels out all their strengths, why does Jesus even bother listing them? Why does he even go into saying, I see that you do this. I see that you're, you're doing this well. You see, a church can have many outwardly impressive things seemingly going for it. But an absence of love means that church is on life support spiritually. It is in danger of disappearing as a church without love. Am I coming across? Do you see why this was such a serious issue when Jesus Christ says, I've got something against you. You left your first love. It's indisputable that in and of itself, this great work ethic that was present in the Ephesian church would appear to be a very strong indicator of a healthy church. But the reality is that a church can be very active in ministry and still be so far from Jesus that they're in danger of him removing them from their community. I'm talking about understanding the love of Jesus Christ. Come on. Just think on secular thought lines here. If I married a woman and never gave her any attention, do you think that my marriage would last? Stop and just think that if I ignored my beautiful wife and just took care of my business, because I've got to take care of my business, my work, I've got a job, I'm the breadwinner of this house, never gave my wife any attention, never greeted her, never stopped and talked to her. See her in passing, maybe we'd eat meals together, very rarely speak. What kind of a relationship would be developed there? What kind of love would be felt there? It's the same thing. Love involves action. Love takes into understanding that we have accountability and that there is action that is required in order to reciprocate that love with one another. Jesus Christ, the one that loved us first, gave his life for you and I, would you not think that he would deserve some attention? Do you think that we can let him sit to the side and not open up our Bibles and read about all of the promises that he gave to us and expect that we would be encouraged to know more of this wonderful Savior. Love requires an action. And this church in Ephesus says they had left 
their first love. You say, well, sounds like they were having quite a bit of trouble in that city and in that church, and that there was a lot of persecution. Sounds like that Roman emperor was a person you didn't want to be around. I mean, come on. Wouldn't that just kind of make you shy away from being proclaimed as a Christian? I mean, why? Is it worth the trouble? (laughs) Jesus Christ paid the price so that we could have salvation and redemption brought back to God Almighty. And here is where, again, we're speaking about this love that is so important to keep fresh and to keep on fire. Another thing to understand, being doctrinally sound is not a guarantee of loving God and others either. Thirty years before this letter was written, Paul had warned the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. He says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul very, very emphatically pointed out, he said, there will be people that will try to tear your church apart. But you have got to hold to the love of Jesus Christ. About 30 years before John recorded this vision in Revelation, Paul tells Timothy in the first first chapter of 1 Timothy, he says, As I besought thee, speaking to Timothy, to abide still at Ephesus, When I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Paul said the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. In other words, one of the main reasons Paul wants Timothy to teach good doctrine and squelch the false teachings is so that the good doctrine will result in love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. One of the aims of emphasizing good doctrine and guarding against false teaching should always be to produce love in the hearers. But it's also clear that teaching good doctrine does not necessarily result in love for God and others. Let me explain. If a church grows proud because they teach the truth, while so many other churches don't care about doctrine, that will kill love. If we lift ourselves up and proclaim ourselves to be inclusive, that nobody else has the truth, it will kill love. At the same time, if you weaponize good doctrine to attack others who disagree with you or are not serious about doctrine, that will smother love as well. 
if we take and use all of our verses, all of the things to attack another, where is our love in all of that? In those unhealthy contexts, sound doctrine will not result in love. Here's another point to consider. This lack of love in the Ephesian church is a, a loss of evangelistic witness to the world. Jesus here says that if this church in Ephesus doesn't repent and do the works that they did at first, he will remove their lampstand, their light. He will remove their witness to the surrounding area. Beyond that, Jesus, speaking of the end time, says in Matthew 24, verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Let's go to that next screen. So that's what Jesus reveals as the problem with the Ephesian church. Now let's take a look at the solution to the problem. Found in verse 5 that we just read, Jesus says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick, out of his place, except thou repent. One of the first things Jesus commands this church to do is remember. Remembering is an important and easily overlooked part of a healthy walk with God. This is why God established the Passover and other important festivals or feasts to commemorate significant parts of Israel's redemptive history and the reason that we celebrate communion together is as Jesus commanded do this in remembrance of me here Jesus wants the Ephesian church to use their collective memory to recall what it was like before they lost their first love. They needed to recall the way that they loved God and each other so that they would know what repentance would look like. They, they were encouraged to remember the love, the joy, and the peace. They were encouraged to remember the sense of intimacy and security that they had in God, to remember the joy of gathering together and praising Him and worshiping Him, to remember even the tears of joy, to remember when you loved the Word of God and enjoyed reading it and studying it, to remember when prayer wasn't just a task or a burden, but a joy, to remember when you much more deeply treasured that fellowship of the local church. We're called to bring these things back into memory. Remember where you have been with the Lord. And that'll help you find the second part of the solution to the Ephesian problem. That is to repent. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul calls that godly sorrow. Repenting is a change of mind toward a sin. That doesn't mean that a sin you once thought was bad, you now think is okay. No. This is a radical change in your mental and your emotional disposition toward a sin. And finally, what the Scripture in other places calls the fruit of repentance, 
is Jesus' third step in the solution to the problem of lovelessness. And that is, do the works you did at first. When a person genuinely repents, that is always going to result in a change of behavior. Always. If a person genuinely repents, they long to do the works they did at first. Let's go to that next screen. The promise, verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I'm going to stop there just one minute because we'll come into the, another part of another letter and we'll speak more about the uh, Nicolaitans. But in Galatians 1, verse 9, it reads, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be accursed. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The third final section of the letter is Jesus' warning and his promise to the Ephesian church. The promise that Jesus makes is in verse 7. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And again, to conquer in this context means to remain faithful and love God and others to the end. I want to read to you from Genesis chapter 2, that promise of the tree of life, Genesis 2, verse 9. When God created all things, it says, Genesis 2, 9, it says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Flip with me also to Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The right. Who's given us that right? Jesus Christ only. And in that true love that we bring to that table here, this is the promise that we are given. That we will be given to eat to him that overcometh. We will be given to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So as this first letter shows, there is no amount of of zeal for the truth or moral righteousness that can replace a heart full of love for Jesus Christ. We've got to do it all. We've got to have it all here. John spoke of this in the 14th chapter of his gospel, verse 20. He says, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. This is Jesus speaking. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Verse 23 of John 14 goes on to say, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. These are promises of God. Even as it says in 1 Corinthians 16, 
verse 22. It says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Those are the most interesting words I think I've read. I've read them before, but I've never read them. Listen to what Paul says in that last verse of the first book of Corinthians in declaring the importance of loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Anathema means to be loathed or detested. It is a word that is meaning they are devoted to destruction. If any man does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, he is devoted to destruction. Serious stuff. Same seriousness that we see in this letter to Ephesians. And then, without a comma, a period, or any other punctuation, he says, Maranatha. I mean, I thought that was a Christian gospel group or something, okay? It's in the Word. In fact, Anathema and Maranatha only appear these times in 1 Corinthians 16. Maranatha means our Lord comes. If you do not love the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't know Him as your personal Lord and Savior, you're devoted to destruction. Anathema. Our Lord comes, Maranatha. It's going to happen. Things will come into place. We need to know where we stand here. Even so, even so, come, Lord Jesus. I thank God for His Word. There's so much in it, sometimes it's, it's hard for me to pull all of the things that I want to say out. But I know this, and I know that this is the heart of each and every one of you that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And you follow that first commandment with the second, that you will love your neighbor with that same kind of love even as yourself. So it's with that same kind of salutation, that same greeting, that I'd like for us all just to stand. We'll open it up here that there's anybody that needs prayer. If you don't know that wonderful Savior, we're here to pray with you, agree with you. We're also here to pray with you, to answer prayers, to be a light in a dark, dark world. When these letters come out here as we continue this series on through the time, I'm not sure how many messages there will be. At least one more. We will learn together what the Spirit is speaking to the church today and the importance of holding to the confidence that we have of the hope in Christ that lives inside of us. I can declare to you that that is my saving strength is in knowing Jesus Christ is there with me. Amen? It is for you also. But if you don't know that wonderful master, let's pray together.